Bonjour, good day, and welcome to CIM's virtual event brought to you by the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Today, we'll be talking about a woman's perspective from the boardroom. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, Client Relations at CIM. Thank you for joining us. Some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you selected the control panel. If you dialed with a traditional phone, ensure the phone button is selected. During the presentation, you'll be asked to participate in some polls. Please type the selected multiple choice answers in the poll box in your control panel. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box in the control panel. The questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. And now, without further ado, I'd like to present the moderator of this session, Mafalda Arias. Mafalda is the president of Mafalda Arias and Associates, and Associates, an organization that coaches organizations and individuals to interact, communicate, and manage different differences effectively. The company's innovative training programs help build trust, reduce misunderstandings, and leverage diversity and introduce collective empowerment through culture. Mafalda has over 25 years of international experience, primarily in the mining and mineral exploration sectors in Canada and Peru. Welcome, Mafalda. Hello. Thank you, Mary Lou. Welcome, everybody. Wonderful to have you here, and I'm so happy my camera is working. I am in Peru, third world country, and the internet, I tell you, is just the lack of the day. So wonderful. We are delighted to have here with us Michelle Ashby. And just to let you know, today's presentation is going to be recorded, so you will have it available for you to listen and take all the pearls of wisdom on the CIM website in the next coming week. We are thrilled to have panelists joining us from all different parts of the world. So type on the chat box where you're joining us today. Let's see, let's see. CIM is an international organization, and I always love to know where people are coming from, and I cannot see the chat right now. Let's see it is okay. I don't see the names of the places, but maybe they're going to be coming up at any moment. If any of you ladies can see the chat and read, that would yeah. be great. But so far, I don't see the chat available. You're, look in the question box, Mathalda. Maybe you'll be able to see it there. We have uh, Oakville, we have Saskatoon, Alberta, Vancouver. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we have someone from Johannesburg as well. Whoa, absolutely. All the corners of the planet on Earth Day. So that's fantastic. Great to have you here. This is a proof how international CIM is. Okay, so let's get going into some of the meat of today's program. And we have a couple of polls for you. And the first one is one that Mary Lou is going to put in a couple of seconds for you to answer on the right side of your panel menu. The poll is gonna come up. There we go, there it is. What's your knowledge on a woman's perspective from the boardroom? Are you aware, basic, moderate, substantial? Mark one of those numbers. Which one resonate with you, with your experience, with what you've noticed? Let's see if we have, okay, the numbers are coming. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, where did it go now? Okay. Okay, 30, 40 percent moderate knowledge. We have quite a substantial, sophisticated audience. 33 percent basic, 13 percent not aware. So there's huge opportunity from this audience to learn from Michelle. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. And now, without further ado, let me introduce you to our presenter today, Michelle Ashby. Michelle is CEO and founder of ACE LLC Ashby Consulting Enterprises. Her focus is on educating, supporting, and teaching women how to attain corporate board positions through the ACE Board Certification Program for Women. Bracket, I've been there. It's a great program. 
Michelle has a diverse background that includes 30 years as a gold analyst, a specialist, financial expert, independent corporate board director, and a successful entrepreneur. She was recently awarded one of the top 25 most powerful business women in Colorado. She has, she's a subject matter expert on board governance, finance, and strategy. For more detailed information about Michelle, if you check on your control panel to the right, you will see an attachment with a handout about her. And without further ado, let me give the microphone to Michelle. Michelle, the floor is yours. Wonderful to have you. Well, thank you, Mafalda. And I'm thrilled that your camera's working as well. <laughs> so good to see your smiling face. Um, I really would like to start with a few comments um, in thinking about the title that you picked, and I'm gonna go into some slides. But before that, I really wanted to touch on a few things about actually a woman's perspective from the boardroom. And to say that I love being in the boardroom. I've been on six corporate boards and I love working in the boardroom. Why is that? There are many reasons why I enjoy that. And first of all, it's where the biggest decisions are made. So to be, part of the conversation and that process, because it is a, it is a process, um, is, is something that I really enjoy. Um, and, I, and I take a lot of, uh, I take it very seriously, okay? I'm, I'm a business nerd. So this is the perfect place for people who love business, who love companies, who love solving problems. The second thing is strategy. So, Boards of directors, particularly in public companies, anytime you're in the C-level and higher, you're really involved in strategy and figuring out what are the goals of the company? What's our vision? Where are we headed? Um, I love doing strategy. So for me, I've had great success with that, which brings me to one of the next things, which is outcomes. I'm very interested in the outcomes. And um, those could be specific to our goals, or they could be specific to the problems we're solving. So problem solving and having challenges, especially if you're in the mining sector, they are always there. You know, once you solve one, something else happens. The price of the metal goes up or down. Um, you know, the shareholders get upset about something. You have a project that has an issue. I mean, the, the, the challenges are always there and I love problem solving. So trying to, you know, use this thing up here between our ears, as opposed to just the computer, but thinking and communicating with other people to try and come up with ideas of how we can solve those problems. I love learning from others, and I've been fortunate to be on boards where there's an incredible amount of diversity. It might not be in gender, but it, it is diverse in the people's backgrounds. And so when we're trying to solve a problem, and um, we, we want to have people around the table who come from different backgrounds, who can bring different scenarios and experiences that they've had to the table. And then we can weigh in on those and go, wow, that's, you know, that was in real estate, but that might apply to us. So I think that is the other thing that really um, excites me about being on boards. Collaboration. It's an opportunity to share ideas, to collaborate and to come up with these solutions with each other. And then the, the last one on my list is responsibility. I feel that um, there's a huge responsibility to the company, to the executive team, to the management, to the shareholders, to the communities that we're doing business in, to our end users. Um, you know, the list is really big. So as a director, you know, this is one of the things that people don't always think about. They're like, oh, what do they do? They just sit there and they vote. They don't do much. Well, we're, we're representing all of these different groups. So it's very important to take into consideration what the impact is gonna be, not just on our shareholders, but also on our employees, on our management, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the things that I thought of when I was asked to talk a little bit about a woman's perspective in the boardroom. So I spoke to it in regards to being my gender nerd self, which I think is the most appropriate. And, um, and we'll go into some of the, you know, now I'm gonna do a presentation. Some of you may have seen this or known some of these statistics. I'm gonna go into some statistics about how many women 
and men are currently sitting on boards primarily in North America, so in the US and Canada. For those of you who've seen some of this before, this may be a refresher or an update for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we're gonna go into, whoops, sorry. I am having a little challenge here. Oh, here we go. Okay, great. All right, so let's ask the question, how do we get to the top? So when we look at the difference in the genders, there's research out there that we all know about, which says that when a man and a woman are equally experienced and, and uh, skilled and educated, have uh, an opportunity for uh, a promotion, the man is more likely to raise his hand and say, pick me, I'll give it a go, when they have 60%. Um, women tend to sit there and their voice says, ooh, don't raise your hand, you only have 60% you need more, you maybe aren't good enough. Whatever that voice is in our head, as women can get in our way. And I actually asked, um, I told this story to a couple about a month ago. And after I told the story, I turned to the guy and I said, so what's your number? And he said, oh, 10%. I'll raise my hand and say, you know, pick me and then I go figure it out. So it's interesting to see the difference in are um, what I call the perfectionist gene, which is typically more uh, more the case for women in stopping ourselves from trying to go for it and then figure it out. So it is true also that women do need to get prepared because when we look at the boardroom, there are, are a lot of things that women don't know about boards. And I know this because I interviewed 200 women over 18 months before I started this process of helping women to get on boards. And that's what I realized is, wait a second, they, there's a lot they don't know about what it's like to be in the boardroom or you know, how to get on board. So um, one of my, my mentors uh, has five tips for how to succeed. And the one that pops out that is, a, I think, relevant to what we're talking about today is to do something that scares you, right? Raise your hand. And even though that voice is going, wait a second, you only have 60%, keep the arm up and say, pick me. I can do it better than anyone else. So regardless of your gender, we want you to raise your hand. And then mentors can make all the difference. I had, and I do still have, amazing uh, gentlemen mentors who helped me throughout my career and um, you know, made a huge difference in, in how I ended up uh, in boards, in sitting in boardrooms. I have three pearls of wisdom. These are just from Michelle Ashby. I didn't pick them out from anyone else. But really, it's important to stand out when we are at the top of our game, when we are excellent, whether we're male or female, we are going to be recognized. Stand up. This is harder for women than it is for men. Standing up means brag about yourself, right? It's okay to brag and say, you know what? I am really good at this. And then don't worry about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right. It's also good to give yourself a break and, you know, like kind of let go of the stress of this because there's always another opportunity coming. So let's let's see what we really need to know about women in the boardroom. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's from 1975. This is Catherine Graham and when she was appointed to the board of the Associated Press. And as you can see, the room is full of uh, white men. Our, our demographic today still is the majority of boards. Uh, board seats are held by white males who are 63 years old. And I'm speaking about uh, the US, US and Canada. So when I started doing this research in 2016, I was looking at how long will it take us to get to parity, so 50-50. So guess what? If the Fortune 500 companies were making progress pretty quickly, we could get there as soon as 2032, which is right around the corner. But on all the other boards, um, it will take us up to 70 years at the pace that we're going. So we can definitely speed that up, hopefully. Let's take a look at the facts globally. So Deloitte's report in 2019 said that overall reporting companies, reporting companies, so this would exclude private companies, were running at about 17%, okay, overall. And um, also in North America, when we look at the US, we're at about 28% women on boards right now, and then 
Um, in Canada, it's about 27% as of 2019. So neck and neck, we're very much uh, about the same in these large companies. Only 5% of the boards uh, have only one woman in the United States. And um, that's that actually started in 2019 when the last holdout company added a woman to their board in 2019 of the Fortune 500 companies. Well, that only took, you know, how many hundreds of years, but anyway, we're, we're on, we're on the track and it's, and it's starting to pick up some steam. Let's look at the rest of the market. So the Fortune 500 are the very top of that pyramid, right? These are the largest companies and underneath that there's thousands of companies that are still publicly traded. And in that sector, we're at about 20%. And that's come up quite a bit. When I first started looking at this, it was 14%. So we're moving up, up quite a bit, like about a percent per year. But let's take a look at California. They passed legislation requiring companies to appoint women to their boards and need to have three women on boards by 2022. And we think more states are gonna start doing this quota. But let's take a look at some of those numbers um, in this next slide. So um, this is Bill 826. And in 2020, there were 650 companies in California, and only 2% um, of them by the end, uh, by October 2020, had no women. Now, mind you, the fines are quite steep. It's $100,000 per, uh, you know, if they don't have a woman on the board for the first one and $300,000 for the second one. But there's a report that came out October 2020 from the Secretary of State. And so these are really more recent numbers. As of that time, there were at least 1,940 board seats that still needed to be filled by the end of 2021. So that's a huge number of uh, board seats that are open for and looking for women to fill them. So California still is in the race to get more women on their boards. One of my favorite um, resources that I use in the US is a, is a newsletter called Director Moves. And they monitor every public company that has a market cap, cap over 165 million. If we look at the past few years, they also follow by gender, how many women were added to boards and how many men. So you can see in this slide in 2018, there was a huge amount, 659 women were added to boards, 550 men stepped off of boards. So we almost saw this one-to-one -one replacement. And the same thing is true in 2019. Um, that changed in 2020 with COVID. We saw women being added to boards, but the men did not step off. And we think that's an anomaly because of the crisis that we were going through that any gentleman who was at the point of retirement uh, probably was asked to stay on through the crisis or offered to stay on the board until they got through the pandemic. So far uh, this year in 2021, we're again seeing that pace. Women are outpacing men, 198 uh, women on boards uh, versus 120 men stepping off. And here's another interesting fact that's been very recent. In late 2020, the NASDAQ asked the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States to put forth a, a, a regulation that every company that's listed on NASDAQ would have a requirement, must have what, at least one woman and one minority man or woman on the board in order to be listed on NASDAQ. That is still in the talks. It has not been passed, but we're thinking that that's going to happen probably before the end of 2021, that we would see something like that that would come into place for the NASDAQ companies. Um, so the bottom line is, if we're gonna to get to parity, we still need a lot more women to get on boards. And that's the reason that I'm training a thousand women to help that happen faster and to help women understand what they need to know in order to get on boards and to be comfortable in the boardroom because it's a very different culture than anything that they've been exposed to if they haven't been on a board. Um, I always like to shoot this, this little slide out about CEOs in the gender realm. And when we look in uh, in the United States, we're at about 6% uh, women who are in the CEO role in the largest companies, the Fortune 500s. 
And in Canada, I don't have the exact percentage, but I have read an article that said, if your name is Michael, you're more likely to be the CEO of a top 100 company in Canada than if you're a woman. And in the US, it's John. So um, we have a long way to go in, in the CEO role. A lot of people ask me, or they're concerned like, well, I haven't been a CEO, would I still qualify to get on a board? And so there are a few questions that I like to just place these answers to because they're very generic. So most people come from positions other than CEO. Um, you no longer have to have boardroom experience, although when a specification comes through looking for uh, people, sometimes it does say that they do want people that have previous boardroom experience in public boards, but it's less and less. Um, you don't have to be a financial expert. There are many other skills that boards are looking for. And younger people are getting on boards at, at a record pace than they ever have before. And this is because of our digital world, right? It's important to have people who understand, um, you know, the, the kinds of things we need to understand at the board level. Cybersecurity is one that's very important. And then our compensation median, both in the US and Canada, in these top companies, is about $300,000 a year. So it's not bad for, uh, you know, for that type of a position, basically a part-time job. So let's circle back to where we started. How do you get to the top? And, you know, this is for each one of us, very individual. We have to, we have to figure out, first of all, what it is that we want and be really clear about it. Because if we don't know, how in the world can someone else help us to get there? Um, set the intention to get what you want and then ask for your for what you want and keep asking until you get it. My intention and what I want is to work with women who are courageous enough to step up into the boardroom and CEO roles to make those big decisions. That's my clarity in what I want. So um, you all are aware of uh, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her statement, I've changed it a little bit, in that what I say is that women belong in all the places where the biggest decisions are being made because I believe that most important room in the business world is the boardroom because this is where the power and the money lie and the men are in authority making the decisions. So we want to join them in helping to make those decisions. You have access to my information um, because we've got that in one of the attachments. And then um, it's time for Q&A. So I will let Elaine take this down for me and we'll go back to our visual. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. This was not only insightful, but obviously very thought provoking to, you know, see those numbers in black and white about where are women in terms of board opportunities and where where are the the hiccups if you want to call it or refer to it that way so um before we go into the next segment which is the q a let's just do a quick poll this is our second and last poll for today's presentation and uh mary lou and i and Elaine are loading it right now, so there we are. So now that you have attended today's session, did you learn something new? Was this informative? Or no, you were already aware of the subject. Or you know, well, is this something that you would share with other people in your organization, with friends, with colleagues, with other women that you know? How is it? Okay, let's see where is this coming. Okay, so we're still collecting some responses. So perfect. So far is, oh yeah, the numbers are keep on going up. Wonderful. Okay. 77% have voted. We still have 42 seconds. So don't be shy. We don't know who you are or how you're voting, but just share what you have discovered from today, from being with us and from listening to Michelle's experience in this subject. Okay, there we go. So 77% 70, has voted. 47% thought that this was very informative. 
learn something new today. 12% said this has substantial impact and they will share with their team. And if, if there was nobody that says, you know, I'm not, I'm now aware, not learning anything new. So everybody was aware of the, of the topic with more degrees than other ones. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Thank you for sharing with us and uh, letting us know what was your knowledge before and after the session. So before we go into uh, Q&A, Michelle, I was just uh, shocked about some of the numbers. Seems to me that new requirements from stock exchanges, it's something that can really move into board opportunities for women, like the case in California, for example. Mm -hmm. That was stunning. And that only in Canada, 27% are on board by 20, 2019. So let's see if there are some questions as we keep on uh, going on. And um, I have one question here. So what do you want to know about getting on boards? That's the question from what they need to know. Yes. Ah, that's a whole course. <laughs> right, Mafalda? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, it's not like a job. I would tell you that right now. You need a board resume, which is different than your professional resume. You need to understand how to do a board interview. Um, you, need, you need to know about the culture. I say that it's an executive vernacular in the boardroom. And so um, that's, that's uh, you know, th there's so many nuances around that. But when we talk about the nuts and bolts, we talk about board governance, financial acumen, risks and responsibilities, and then, you know, the gender dynamics in the boardroom. That's what we cover in, in our class. So those are the things that you need to know. But for your own use, you definitely want to look into how do I do a board resume? And what is the difference between that and, you know, uh, my professional resume? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and from experience, I can attest it's a completely different resume. Doesn't even come close to the resume that you use on a regular basis. It's, a, it's an art in itself just to focus on how you have to put your board skills that you already have, perhaps, and you put them in black and white in terms that are easily read, pick up and notice. But it's, it's, it's an art, absolutely. I have another question here is, how do I identify boards to serve on, or how do I identify the opportunities? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question because there's really no central database that you can go to to find out what those are. And typically in the old days, right, it was really like, you know, it was word of mouth, really. You know, um, the guys, we'd sit around the table and go, who do you know? And the names would fly around and we'd talk, you know, talk to a few people and then pick somebody. But it's quite sophisticated now and it's also quite competitive. So there are now a lot of people who are saying their resources. So they'll send you an email and say, oh, I saw that you Googled, I want to get on a board and we've got this great service. You can send us your resume. We'll put it in our database. We'll charge you $1,500. We'll do a couple, you know, hours of coaching with you, and then some CEO or some nomgov chair is gonna pick you out of our database and put you on the board. Don't do that. Nobody gets picked up for a board from a database. It just doesn't happen. Um, in Canada, the best place for women to go is to join Women Get On Board. It is $300 Canadian a year. They post, I think, board openings two, every two weeks. And they post nonprofit, community, um, you know, there's a lot of service awards, they're government, government boards, sorry, and also public boards that are paying. So you have a whole variety. So let's say that you're a woman and you're like, I wanna get some experience, where should I go? You might, you know, join Women Get On Board. They have some great programming. Deborah Rosati runs it, she's a good friend of mine and very like-minded to me as to what, you know, helping a lot of women get on boards. And um, so they have great programming, but they also, you know, have opportunities where you could go serve on a community board or a government board or trade association board potentially to get experience and exposure before you get into a corporate board. 
So that's one place in Canada that's quite good. In the US, um, it's, it's really sporadic. So um, I know for our graduates, when they go through the program, I get, ex I get approached a lot uh, by companies and organizations and recruiters who are looking for qualified candidates. So, you know, just by word of mouth, we are now, you know, putting people forward for boards. Um, Director Moves is the other potential place where you can watch their newsletter and see when board openings are coming. But um, yeah, it's tough to it's tough to point you in one specific direction, to be honest with you. Here's the rule of thumb. I have a 90-10 rule. 90% 90 of you are going to get on boards because of people who know you, people you know, or someone who knows you who refers you to someone else. So it's really about being more proactive. If this is something, if this is a wish, an objective in life, something that we want to achieve, it's about being proactive. I know very well what do you want from uh, getting into a board. What are the, what are your objectives? What is your professional strategy? And then finding a board that is suitable to where you're aiming. Yeah. Right. You've got to, you've got to, you know, do the work for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, another question then, how, you know, not all of us may be, you know, may be able to go to a, a board right away, a, a board that is a paying board. So uh, which boards are more suited for me as a volunteer of an organization? That's one of the questions that we have. How okay. do I begin that process? To find one? Yes, a volunteer board. Um, you know, I think, again, I would definitely look at, um, there are, I know that the government posts some, and I don't know exactly where to where to direct people, but there are places to go there. But Women Get On Board has, they have the most current list. Um, but here's the other thing. What's going to be the best benefit for you? You want to just, you don't want to just go anywhere. To sit on a board, you want to go someplace that's going to have other people who are influencers. And I think the best place to start is a trade association, a trade mm -hmm. association where professionals are serving on the board with you. Um, so in the mining industry, that could be PDAC or it could be CIM. It can be a lot of organizations in your sector. And Denver, you know, Colorado, it's the Denver Gold Group. I started and ran that for 18 years, and that's where I gained my, uh, you know, I think my the people stood knew I stood out because they knew who I was for running that, um, you know. But there are a number of trade associations where you can participate, and maybe you just get on a committee and you start there and help develop, you know, a program or whatever it may be. But this is one way for you to build relationships with influencers who can then eventually help you to get on a paying board. So what's the shortest route from here to there? So if you're going to volunteer, make sure that you're getting value for your time as well as providing, you know, providing a service and value to the organization. And that's not to say that there aren't nonprofits that can do that too. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the U.S., it would be large nonprofits like United Way, for instance. If I sat on the United Way board, I'd be across the table from very influential CEOs and people who, you know, have a lot of power and, you know, can, can make things happen. So those relationships could be very beneficial. So just be very strategic about where you end up doing that. Okay. Sounds like a strategic FD were for a lot of the things related to opportunities in boardrooms for women, not only from you know, developing your resume, the context that you have, but also finding opportunities for yourself. Right. And can I just say, Mafalda, that we are in a bull market right now. So I'm an analyst and I know I know bull markets when I see them and I know they go away. So I have this sense of urgency to get women in this in this in the pipeline as quickly as possible because the door is going to shut when these board when we reach a certain percentage and it might be 30 40 I don't know what the market's going to tolerate but once it's saturated the flow is going to slow down dramatically it is not going to be the numbers that I showed you of women getting on boards so how big is that window how long is it going to take us well we know California is going to end the end of 2021 right 
Um, if NASDAQ comes into play, that could be another two years. I don't know what timeline they're going to put on it, but I guarantee you they will. They're not just going to say, oh, you have to have people. They're going to say, by a certain date, you have to have this this box checked, and then the next day you have to have that box checked. So that'll be another incredible opportunity for us. But once those are gone, they it's going to be much harder for uh, for us. We're just not going to find as many opportunities as we have right now, right now. So today is the day. Today's to the day. Serious. Yeah, today is the day to get serious about this. And as you know, NASDAQ is going through this process, I would imagine other stock exchanges in North America, in the world, and private companies are going to get into the same uh, vision of uh, moving forward board opportunities. I don't think so. Private companies don't have the pressure that public companies do. And I can tell you, that I've only seen one, one report to date, and I've been researching this since 2016, uh, of how, what's the percentage of uh, women on boards in private companies, because they don't have to report, so we, we only can know by a survey. So 350 companies were surveyed, and of those 350 companies, 11% had, a, so their boards were 11% women, so much lower than where we are in the public market, but they are not required to do that. They could stay at 11 or go down. It's not required for them. So I don't know that we would see that that kind of pressure that we see in the public market. Now, if the client, uh, if the buyer of the product says, wait a second, I'm going to stop buying your product because you don't have any women representing us, that could, that could have some effect. If a major PE, private equity group or, or fund that's investing huge amounts of money comes in and says, oh, we're pulling, you know, like you need to cash us out because blah, 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 that could have an effect. But we we don't have the same kind of pressurized market, um, ex, you know, market exter external uh, issues that would that would make a private company necessarily go into this direction. So is the fine, the pressure of the finance industry as within the S, um, the uh, environmental social goals, the SDGs and, and all of these spectrum of social responsible uh, things pushing companies to have more stakeholder representation in all different areas of the organization, including the board. I think that same pressure might be coming to other areas that don't have the requirement as listed companies do have to have more board opportunities. I don't know. You know, I, I see I, I, I'm a member of a private directors association, so I'm watching what they're talking about, um, that they mostly talk about, you know, family owned businesses, how to, you know, figure out succession, how to sell the business. Um, only unless their their intention is to go public. Yes. If their intention is to go public. Yes, they do then pay attention to these kinds of things because they can't go public in some cases. Like Goldman Sachs came out and said, we're not going to IPO any company that doesn't have a woman on their board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Done. Not just not going to happen. So, um, you know, we there are situations where that kind of pressure definitely would affect. And it would also mean, you know, from the ESG side. But yeah, uh, yeah but but again, in a private company, unless there's some external pressure or it's the consciousness of the people who are running the company that that's important to them, mm -hmm. they have a choice to either opt in or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So public companies, that's where the opportunity is the most for uh, women that are interested in looking yeah. for board positions. Yeah. Fantastic. That being said, that being said, there might be women in our group here who own a company and they have a cons consultancy let's say to the mining industry, maybe they provide a sustainability, you know, contract uh, consulting business or something. Now, as a consultant to a private company, you may want to opt in. You might think about it in terms of, okay, I like this company a lot. I really love how this private company is very conscious of their, of their social, you know, license and everything. And I really feel comfortable with the people who run it. The conversation you could have with them is, you know what, love what you do, love who you are, love where you're going. And if you ever want to add someone to your advisory board, I'd be interested. And that's a way for you to open the door 
for them to opt in and, and invite you to the board or to say no. And I've had women who, that have gone through my training who've done exactly that and who've ended up on the board. So that's an option for people who have those relationships because not everyone is suited for a public board. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, there is another question here. How to align my skills in the best way with board opportunities? Well, again, I think that comes back to the board resume and that's a huge exercise. So you really need to understand um, the difference between how your professional experience counts when you're looking for a job versus how your background counts when you're looking for a board. And, um, you know, so, so I know we keep harping on this, but there, there are very specific things about how you uh, would represent those skills. And because it's so individualized, and Mafalda can tell you when I work with people, it's, it, she's very different than that woman who's sitting next to her. So her resume has to look like her. We have to highlight Mafalda's background, the fact that she, you know, has been on junior company boards, the fact that she's been involved in, you know, public companies. And I believe you were secretary, right? Yeah. yeah. So she has these skills that we can we can collect and then we highlight them in her board resume along with her length of, you know, of experience. So 25 years in the mining sector, uh, international, she's bilingual, you know, it goes on and on and on. But it has to also be um, articulated in a specific way. I'm very, very picky about how women represent themselves when they're going into a board seat. And that's not to say that someone in the, in the audience has great relationships, could pick up, you know, to send an email after we get off here and to one of their buddies and say, you know what, I just watched this thing on getting on boards, never occurred to me, I'd love to get on a board. Do you think I'd be good, you know, good for a board? And the person could turn around and say, oh my gosh, we'd love to have you on our board. That's happened before too. So sometimes you don't even need the resume. It depends on what the relationship is between people. Yeah. I didn't have a resume till much, much later in my life because entrepreneurs usually don't have one, you know? So I don't know if I answered the question, but we do have a primer series and I've got a special running on my website for $59 and 50 cents. And we do a module on your board resume. So that might be a, a quick solution to help you get it, you know, learn about it. There's a 42 page workbook, so you can, you can take that. Yeah. I think that that's a really great start to start getting, switching our mindset from either working for somebody or being a consultant to looking into a board opportunity for whatever reason you want to do it because it's your desire, you want to help a company, you're aligned with your values and their values. So I think that that's a really good opportunity. Um, I have another question here. Um, it says, would love to be a value addict. This is, uh, this is gonna be our last question here. Um, but if you have other ones there, Marilu and Elaine, if I've missed one, just please let me know. I uh, would love to be a value added board member at the time that I am right now in my careers where I can help people grow. But I don't know anything about getting on boards. Can you, can you give me a hand? Can you tell me something about it? Yeah, so I think, like I said before, getting on boards is a, a process now that has become more sophisticated and it is a, a more competitive. So again, you want to be prepared. You need to, you know, maybe do some training, um, get your board resume together and then start asking people, you know, letting people know, I'm interested in getting on a board. Um, you may have a few mentors that you could go to and say, you know, can I get some advice from you on how, how, how would I get on a board? of XYZ company. I'm very interested in them. I know your buddies with them, et cetera, et cetera. But you better be ready because the process is very intense right now. There isn't just one female candidate anymore for an open board seat. There might be 10 or 20. And so you really have to stand out and um, you really have to be prepared 
as I said, for that board interview piece and be able to answer the questions that they will have that are going to be at the, you know, kind of relative to running a corporation, if you will, solving the problems. In this situation, like in an interview, they may be like, okay, here's the scenario, you know, what would you do? So again, that preparedness is really, really important so that you are very comfortable going in there and you've got the best shot of anybody of getting that seat. Yeah, absolutely. And it just reminded me um, a situation that I had a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a board opportunity and somebody that knew of me or my interest in uh, social practice issues and social responsibility approach. I said, there's, there's an opportunity in the board. Somebody has to leave for whatever reason. We would like you to consider, you know, participating in our boredom. It's like, wow, you know, that and it just happened. Uh, so it was like, it does happen as long as you are uh, exactly what you said. You know, you have to be clear. You know, have that clarity. This is what you want. Um, right. So okay. why did you end up on that board? Tell me why. Sorry. Why? Sorry? Did, why aren't you on that board? Why I got into that board? Because it was aligned with my values about being socially responsible when you are doing work within the mining industry with the stakeholders working with indigenous people, getting everybody's voices, uh, breaking the, the norms in a good sense of exceeding the expectations of how social practitioners work, not only doing what the law tells you to do, going above and beyond that so that you are truly the neighbor of choice you're not only the company of choice you're the neighbor of choice you're the employer of choice and that connection between organization and neighborhood if you want to put it that way so it so, was so you said no no i say yes okay <laughs> and then i'm it, happy i am delighted i'm floating on air every time i get get into board meetings it's just the conversations are stimulating the people that are around. Is that I cannot even believe I am sitting with these people. It's, right. It's just better than ice cream. What can I tell you? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Good idea. And you know, as Mafalda brought up, she was she was tapped, right? She was invited. And that's been my experience through my career is I've been invited to every board I've been on so far. So I so that 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 is because of the standout stand up you're recognized you're the best in your field and they see it and they are like i want that value brought to my board i want that person to be our board we trust her we know what she can do because we've seen her do it in the world and that would be really great if that was part of our corporation as well so does that make sense yes sure it resonates perfectly thank you Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any more questions and we are in our 10 minutes sort of to keep on digging into the Q&A. Mary Lou or Elaine, is there any questions that you see that maybe I've missed? No, I think you've got them all. Okay, perfect. Anybody else? Maybe uh, last minute, maybe instead of typing it, you would like to speak up and we'd love to hear your voice. That could be a choice too. We that would be 24 great to know that people yeah to hear voices i think so and then i'll shut up and when we are three minutes before the hour i'll have to say you know mute all the mics because we cannot keep on having this conversation we get all excited about it right okay let's see what we're doing any other question coming up anybody that wants to raise their hand or say something we want to hear from you. Okay, where do I see the hand here? Let's go to that board. Is anybody with their hands up? Okay. No. Okay. They're shy today. No. Yeah, quiet crowd today. Maybe I know, I know. You have to I know leave them with a lot of things to think about. They are I know. Most, most, of this information. Questions, yeah, most of the questions have been answered. I'm just checking very quickly to see if there was any new ones. No, there's no. Thank so you. sometimes, sometimes people ask me, you know, should I just be looking for companies that are in my own backyard? And the answer is yes. And um, the reason I train women in the U.S. and Canada is because I sit on boards in the U.S. and Canada. 
And our regulations are very similar. And so I would encourage you to really expand your view and to realize, wait a second, there is a company in the US that I really admire, that I like what they do. Um, maybe I'll go for that one because, you know, maybe there's a company in the US that's trying to build their brand in other countries and Canada is a very positive place for Americans to go because of our proximity and because of our language, you know, being the same and similarities in so many ways. So uh, that's another question that people often will ask. And so I encourage you to look, you know, nationally and of course um, across the border for sure. And maybe even California, you never know. Absolutely, why not? Yeah, NASDAQ, yes, absolutely. Fantastic. So uh, we're getting into the last minutes of our session today and my camera is not working. Luckily it happened at the end, not at the beginning. Um, so what I wanted to uh, mention to all of you is that uh, we have other virtual opportunities. The next one that is coming up is on May 5th and between 2.30 and 3.30 is standard daylight time during the CIM annual convention and expo and will feature part three of the conversation of the indigenous serious talk, cross-industry cross perspective, indigenous inclusion. You'll have more details about this and the handout that is included in this webinar. Um, Michelle, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us your wisdom from opening our eyes and ears to board opportunities to in informing us of the requirements, the things that we need to keep in mind and uh, being with us today. Thank you so much for being thank with you. us. Thank you for having me. It's like, it's my favorite subject as you can tell. So I always love talking about this and I appreciate everyone's participation and I'm so glad to be a part of this today. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for talking to us, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you're uh, you're coming in from. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night and stay safe. Take care. Yes. Thank you.